Hello, all of you What and Rob Green's Earthlings, and welcome to episode three. Holy shit, I probably shouldn't call you What and Rob Green's Earthlings. That's a terrible line. I do apologize. But I want to thank you for listening, and I want to thank a couple of my listeners for providing some answers to questions we had in prior episodes. First one being, are you allowed to post posters on the uh, telephone poles and light poles in the town of Antigonish? A listener came to me with the answer. You are, but only if it's made of wood. You can't tape to the metal ones. Another question we had last episode was, if you are living in a haunted house, does that give you grounds to get out of your mortgage? The answer is no. Someone told me that one as well. So we're getting places with this. I hope everyone's getting through this lockdown okay. I do want to thank you for listening to me. I know you could be doing lots of other things like using a coloring app. I don't know if you've seen these. You download the app. It gives you a picture. You press a color. You press an area in the picture and it fills it in for you. It is the laziest goddamn thing. Why wouldn't you just look at a picture? Fuck that. What are we coming to? Yeah, I'm still uh, working and doing this thing and watching some Netflix. Don't know if anyone's seen. They have a new uh, follow-up episode of Tiger King out where Joel McHale, who is a a better host, a better comedian, and if I'm being honest, he's better looking than I am. Uh, He interviews a bunch of the cast members. No Joe. No Carol Baskin, but it's a little bit interesting if you want to see what's going on with some of these people in the aftermath of that. Brings me to uh, something I want to kind of get off my chest. Uh, Years back, I was into sports and whatnot. I had a baseball, and I noticed the the outer layer of leather, the skin was peeling off at one time. So what I did was I took the inner ball out, and I found one of those like super balls, you know, the really bouncy ones that was the same size. And I put that inside the baseball skin and I sewed it back up with some red thread. And I had a buddy toss it to me when we were all fucking around one day playing. And I just fucking laid into it. That thing went about 450 feet if it went an inch. I mean, it was just gone. And everyone was standing around just kind of watching me like, What the fuck? Dude, why aren't you in the majors? I was like, well, I I can't throw all that well. Dude, you could totally be a designated hitter on an okay ball team. You could be rich right now. I'm just looking back now. I don't know if I ever told everybody involved the difference. So I just had to get that off my chest. So if I can admit to something like that and get that off my chest to clear my conscience, you know, something to that great degree, I really feel like Carol Baskin can tell us, what the fuck happened to her husband, Don Lewis? I'm dying to know. They've reopened the case, so maybe we'll get some answers. Probably not. Not holding my breath on that one. So I was able to get a hold of an old friend of mine who happens to be in the entertainment business, and I was able to badger the shit out of him until he finally agreed to be on this podcast. He's a graphic designer. He's a graphic artist. He's written graphic novels. He's an actor. He's been in a Stephen King movie, which is pretty goddamn cool. And he is a professional wrestler. Holy shit, you heard me right. He's a wrestler. So I want to introduce this guy with the kind of bravado he deserves. So uh, let's give this a go. Making his way to the podcast from Antigonish, Nova Scotia, weighing in at 245 pounds, old school, Andre Myatt. Andre, I want to thank you for joining me on this. I know you're a busy man. You're still working. Uh, yeah, partially, but uh, from home, so you know, I have some time. Right on. It's so, a to be here. Thanks for having me. A lot of people uh, listen to this. Wink, wink, maybe. <laughs> Tell everyone about yourself. Uh, my name is Andre Mayette. I am originally from Bayfield, which is in Antigonish County in Nova Scotia, currently residing in Truro. I'm a graphic designer slash actor slash professional wrestler slash trivia host slash uh, artist slash writer, I guess. So... Oh, slash podcaster is the new one. So yeah, I do I do quite a few different things. And I went to high school with Rob Green. You poor son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you wear a lot of hats. Uh, yes, I do. Many, many a hat. It's a shame you cover that bald head with them in the beard. <laughs> I, I like that look for some reason. Uh, thanks. Well, it's not, it's, well, it is my choice now, but um, it was sort of necessity because I started losing my hair and I didn't want to be mid-20s to the bald spot. I seen what my dad looks like and I decided that, <laughs> to skip that route and just shave it off. And then my face looked really, it was just one big, you know, when you don't have hair and, and nothing else, I figured I'd try to grow a beard. It is a glorious beard. It's oh. better than mine and a lot of people compliment me on my beard. Ah, yours is, yeah, yours is like thick and dark. Mine's like red. <laughs> I try well, to tame it as best I can. but Well, it can't be perfect, but I mean, you're trying. That's true. I am. I am. Every day's a struggle. All right. So you mentioned 
professional wrestler. People that listen know that I'm a fan of wrestling. You want to tell me how you got into it? Uh, I was a fan in high school. If you recall, you and I used to discuss it a lot and also watch it and stuff. And then I, when I got out, I saw a poster for an indie show when I moved to Toronto for school and I went to watch it. It was really bad. It was like in a boxing club. There was like, <laughs> there was like three people in the audience. Me and a friend were like the two of them. And uh, these guys just like were some of the worst wrestling I'd ever seen. But, you know, they were local guys just trying to do it. I don't think they had any training or any experience. And afterwards, they were like, oh, you're a big guy. You should you should come do this sometime. And that's like, um, okay, you know, because I mean, I was interested and I was young and I didn't really know the difference. It's just sort of funny to like recruit. Like anybody that's, that's really been in wrestling, like in the business, recruiting an audience member like at a show is just so insane. <laughs> like, it's just not done. So, you look uh, like a big guy. Why don't you come here and play with us? Get in here, yeah. So anyway, I did that to moderate whatever. Like it wasn't a big thing by any stretch of the imagination. But I'd met some people through it that were younger guys that were interested in a well that went through the proper channels and kind of recruited me later to join them, which is generally New Breed Wrestling, which started kind of into Burt and the True area. And then uh, through them, I kind of got more experience and got involved with more things and more organizations, and did some traveling to do it, and still do. It's really fun. It's a, the community is really good around here, and the uh, fans are fantastic. And right now, obviously, there are no shows, but I'm looking forward to being able to get out there and do some more in the future. Right on. You done much traveling with it? Uh, yeah, I've been to all the maritime provinces to wrestle, which is not not like a huge thing to admit about, but. Uh, I'd been Newfoundland on several tours there. I got to, to uh, wrestle with and be on tour with a lot of cool people. So some names in the business. I also did it in Hell of, like around Nova Scotia, of course. PEI, I wrestled re- regularly there, sometimes in uh, New Brunswick as well. The farthest I'd been is Winnipeg. I got to go on a tour out there, which is really cool. Me and another local wrestler, uh, Brody Steele, went out there and did a, a week-long tour of Portage La Prairie and uh, a few native communities further north. It was a very interesting experience, uh, and it was a lot of fun. I was supposed to wrestle um, Harry Smith, the son of uh, the British Bulldog. So when I first got there, um, I guess we can just go into funny stories. But when I first get there, we we get off the plane, we get to the hotel, and um, Tony Cordello was the uh, the booker, who is a very famous wrestling promoter. He's the one that like Edge and Christian and Jericho and a lot of those wrestlers started with. Like he's been doing it forever. Um, and he's famous for doing these, what they call Northern death tours, where they go on these ice fields and go super far North and wrestle. So anyway, we show up to the hotel and someone's like, well, who's rooming with Harry? And then, uh, Peter Smith, who is someone that's been established wrestler, uh, in the Maritimes for a very long while. He's a big name in Germany and Europe. He's wrestled in a lot of promotions all across the world. They're like, well, you can go with Harry. And Peter's like, well, no. And they're like, what do you mean? He's like, well, when I made my negotiated with you guys, the plan was that I'd have my own room. And then you know, so they're they're talking back and forth with promoters. And this isn't unheard of when it comes to wrestling stuff. It's, it's still a bit of that carny mentality sometimes with, with uh, <laughs> not really knowing what's going on. So somebody goes to talk to Harry because they're making a plan for like what the trip's going to be. Because basically we landed in Winnipeg. The final show of the tour was in Portage La Prairie. Our first shows were like 12 hours north. So anyway, uh, they go and tell Harry and apparently um, Harry didn't, nobody told him that they're going to be driving like seven or eight hours a day to get to these places. And he didn't want to do that. So he literally just got in a cab and drove away, went to the airport and went home. So he just failed. <laughs> he just failed on the tour. So he was a little remember, high. I remember sit- yeah, basically. He, he said something like, you know, I'm a big name in Japan. I don't have to put up with this. Then he went and got in his car and drove away. And I remember watching him get in the cab and be like, see ya, Harry. You know? <laughs> So anyway, it was That's a good tour. I got to wrestle uh, Nick Andrew uh, for that tour, which is really cool. He was on the, oh God, I can't think of the name, the, the show where the people have to run and try to get to places. Oh, the, uh, Basic the Grace. Yeah. yeah. He's on the Canadian version of that. So yeah, for anyone who doesn't keep up, uh, Harry Smith wrestled in the WWE as, what is it, David Hart Smith, they called him? D.H. Smith. Uh, yeah, something like that. But yeah, he, was the, yeah. he was a guy that was in the big leagues for a while, and now he's not. I think he's still, I think New Japan, he's still doing all right there, isn't he? And I haven't followed it super closely, but I think he's still doing stuff out that way. Yeah, maybe. I don't follow a lot of Japan anymore. I don't watch near as much wrestling as I used to. Who else are some of the big names you've worked with or recognizable names, I guess? Um, uh, I've wrestled, um, like, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I wrestled him. Um, I've wrestled Lanny Poffo, uh, the genius, who was, like, Mr. Perfect's manager. He's Macho Man's brother. Yeah, I wrestled Rhino. 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 Yeah, I was on tour with him in uh, in Newfoundland. How is he? Is he stiff? <laughs> no, he's a, he's actually a really funny guy. Uh, I wrestled Cole Cabana. I wrestled Congo Kong, who was the Impact Champion for a while. I wrestled uh, Tyson Dukes, who I think is the Border City Wrestling Champion or Impact as well. I can't remember. I've been on tour with a lot of bigger names, but I've got to wrestle a few of the uh, a few of them, and it's been a, an honor and really cool. Oh, Carlito, I wrestled him a couple times as well. Oh yeah, he was. Oh, and Gangrel. So some of the more <laughs> recent ones have been those ones. 
Nice. Have you ever uh, encountered anyone that wasn't really all that safe to work with? No, there are people that weren't <laughs> very good. <laughs> they weren't um, delicate at all. Not, not even about being delicate. It's just about, you know, trying to protect. There's one person I wrestled. He's one of the nicest per- people in the world. I don't want to bury him. But he had a gimmick that he was basically doing an ultimate warrior thing. So uh, I wrestled him every night for a week on a tour one time across Nova Scotia. And every time he did the warrior splash, you know, and he hit the ropes and then do the splash, mm. um, both his knees would land on my leg, like on my upper thigh. So like <laughs> every night he would like just shatter my leg. And like, as the tour went on, it got worse and worse. Like he didn't mean to, he just, I don't know. It's like one of the smartest moves in wrestling. And the fact <laughs> that he was, he kept bundling it and hurting me was kind of a point of contention with me, but I was trying to be respectful. The guy's been in business for a long time. At that point, it was certainly a lot longer than me. So he, the last night I had a manager and he, he did it and he fell both like right on my legs and, uh, and then got the pin and the match was over. And my manager comes over. He's like, are you okay? And I was like, I think so. But I had a deep bone bruise. Like I could barely walk for like three weeks. Like oh, it was, Christ. it was really, really bad. So really nice guy. Just not great in the ring. I'm going to get that name Eddie after we're done here. Sure. sure. <laughs> so is, is that the worst injury you've had or do you have you had anything uh, that stands out? Uh, the worst one was probably in Newfoundland. I was in a community called Harbor Breton, which is about an hour from uh, Grand Falls, Windsor, Newfoundland. This is the tour that Hacksaw Jim Duggan was on. So there's a long road with no gas stations, nothing. They have all these signs warning you to fill up before you go. It's a little fishing community. It's a nice place. But uh, I was wrestling this guy in a tagging match and uh, there's this kind of a miscommunication. He was supposed to fight out of a submission a duck a clothesline and then take one and he misheard me so he ducked it and then came back and railed one right across my face oh and it's it snapped my nose um really badly like it was all caved in on one side so afterwards i had to get a ride back to uh to grand falls with tax i guess he was going he was in the first car out like everybody else was taking the ring down they just dropped me off the hospital and left to take <laughs> back to the hotel. so i'm sitting like alone in the grand falls windsor like emergency room all like nobody's there i'm the only person and they, they bring me in and the doctor comes in and he goes uh so what you do to your nose there, bye? And there's like this long pause. I'm like, oh, the doctors are from here too. <laughs> <laughs> it was nice. He was a good doctor though. But basically what they did was they just gave me a bunch of painkillers. He straightened it with his finger, his thumbs, as best he could. And then has told me to go see my doctor when I got home. And I had to get basically a nose job when I got back to fix it. My nose is really messed up. Oh, it looks lovely now though. Oh, thank you. Yeah, People can't see it, but it looks like it was brand new yeah. actually if you ever had uh, i'm sure most people haven't had no surgery but it's an interesting experience because they basically the all the stuff from it is like in the back of your throat and in your nasal cavity and the the doctor uh had like they have like a like a suction thing that they use similar to like when you go to the dentist and they take the saliva out of your mouth with that little suction thing. yeah the little like vacuum thing. version they actually stick it like up your nose into the back of your nose cavity and suction out like stuff from the surgery and it was like it's really gross but it's like one it like one they do it it's one of the like the most relieving feelings because your whole thing is open like probably for more than it's ever been in your entire life it's <laughs> like ah like you know i was gonna say that sounds pretty uncomfortable but now that you mention it like my nose yeah, i if anyone knows me personally knows i've done a lot of security work i've been doing like security work started off bouncing at bars and now like i work mm-hmm. for a private company i've had my nose fucked up a few times like if you look mm-hmm. at it now it's got the big bridge on it where you can see it's been broken about six times and one yeah. of the sides of my nose is pretty uh it's not open up as much as it should be which really sucks when i get a cold you know how when the nostrils switch from being stuffed up oh yeah, yeah. i have a good nostril and a bad nostril like some people have like a good knee and a bad knee or I have a good nostril and a bad nostril. My good nostrils <laughs> like clogged up. I just like people just think I'm dying. Just <gasps> like if I get a cold, That's a great excuse though. If I get a cold I... now during this whole COVID nineteen thing, it's gonna be yeah. a goddamn witch hunt because you're just gonna hear me just. <laughs> But yeah, that, that, I've always been like, oh God, I hope I never have to get nose surgery. And that story just made me regret ever thinking that and ever putting it back in place myself or getting one of my buddies to do it. If you do the, uh, the, the guys in Amherst, that's where I had to go. He looks exactly like Louis C.K., which I thought was hilarious. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, this is before he was, uh, you know, when he was just a comedian. <laughs> but he was, <laughs> before he was a target of derision. I'm sure he still looks like him. I, that doesn't change your oh, appearance. I'm sure he probably <laughs> But, uh, Shit, Louis C.K.'s sexual deviant. I got to change my personal style because I kind of look like him. That's right. Um, I think I told him that and he was like, really? I never heard that before, but he looked exactly like him, which I thought was funny. Uh, great doctor. He was, I guess he's like the best nose guy in the Maritimes. So he was really good. Now I'm just going to be doing security and just looking for a reason to get my nose broke so I can go do this now. <laughs> yeah, he told me when I got it done, if I was a boxer or something that it would, like if there's a chance of it getting broken again, he would have waited until my, I was retired. 
mm-hmm. but uh, since it's not a regular occurrence and shouldn't occur again, he uh, he fixed it thankfully because it was pretty messed up looking. It was like half my nose was caved in. So if you look at somebody's nose and you see how it just looks normally on the sides, hmm. on one side it was like conclave. How the missus take that? Ah, uh, well, she worries as much as you know most people. Like wrestling's not a crazy dangerous profession, but certainly things can happen. So you know she worries about stuff like that, but that's fairly. I think when she saw, like, out of 13 years of wrestling, that's the worst thing that's really happened. So I can't complain too much. So for all you people who say it's a fake sport, think about what you just heard. That's right. I mean, the word fake is interesting because it can mean a lot of things. It's usually meant to belittle the, the profession more than anything. You know, when someone's like, you know, that's fake or that's all fake. Uh, I'm always surprised when I still get that question, which I still do on a regular basis. Like when someone finds out I wrestle, it's like, oh, that's all fake though, right? <laughs> yeah. Why do you even ask that at this stage of the game anymore? Like yeah. and there's still people out there that are still kind of like on the fence about it. Like, yeah, maybe. But uh, no, it certainly takes a great amount of skill and a great amount of precision and work to tell a story in the ring like that. So. It's certainly, you know, the, to me, it's like you watch a TV show. You know, Brian Cranston isn't really cooking meth in an RV, but you still enjoy it, right? Like, it's the yeah. Same. I'm pretty sure Brian Cranston knows how to cook meth for real now. I thought I heard that somewhere. That actually, I read. Uh, I think it was true that on that show they purposefully showed you how to make meth wrong, so that people didn't learn how from watching the show. I can attest to that. No, no. <laughs> no. You tried it. You tried it. And it didn't <laughs> I just got a real bad case of uh, diarrhea from it. I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> Well, you probably ate it. I mean, I don't think you should that, get it from... That, ex- that explains everything now. That makes perfect sense. I'm such a bitches. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, maybe that would deter people from like, oh, I'd always wanted to do meth, but I don't think I could afford it. But now that I know how to make it, I just... <laughs> This sucks. I'm never doing like the, drugs again. DIY meth. Just to yeah. enjoy yourself at home. Come across a lot of uh, drug use in the old world of the pro wrestling? Uh, nothing substantial. Um, I've certainly seen some stuff going around. I wouldn't say anything like overly illicit more than just when weed when weed was legal or steroids or that sort of thing, which some guys partake in. I've seen some, I've seen a bit. Uh nothing too crazy, nothing I want to divulge in the sense of getting anybody in trouble. No, Let's no, just no, say no. there are some some other wrestlers that I've been on tour with that I didn't wrestle personally, but it were around that <laughs> enjoy some uh, extracurricular activity. His nickname outside the ring is Snowball. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can tell you more stories later, but I've met a lot of really cool people through, or like just heroes of wrestling. Like I got to meet Kurt Angle, which is really cool. Mick Foley, Christopher Daniels, Samoa Joe, you know, some guys that have kind of doing big things in the industry now, which is cool. Charlie Haas and Raven, I was on tour with them, which is really fun. Who's the biggest asshole you've had to deal with as far as being on tour? Or can you say... You know what? Sure. Um, I've always been kind of like, and I ask this question to other wrestlers. I actually ask them quite a bit when I meet people who are on the road and we're talking. It's like, what's the biggest, like the person in the in wrestling that you've met that like, you looked up to or you thought was really cool and you met them in real life and they were not the type of person that you thought they were. They were kind of an asshole. Or, uh, for me, it's Raven. Uh, <laughs> you know, is he, ca- is he kind of like, arrogant? Uh, kind of is certainly an understatement. Yeah. Uh, he's very, like, he was in a hotel, him and uh, Charlie Haas, and they were like, they're in Truro at Barry's Motel. And they were like, we want to go to the gym. So I, I had the car and I'm local. So I said, yeah, I'll pick you up. So I went to the hotel and, you know, I said, I'll pick you guys up at like one or whatever. And they're like, okay. So they all, I get there at one. He's not ready. Like half an hour later, he's ready. We get in the car. He's like, why'd you park here? Why'd you park over there underneath the tree? I'm like, just get out of the car. Like, 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 I'm, doing, you know, like I'm doing him a favor. And he complains about everything. Like, no matter what decision you make in front of him, it's the wrong one. And he knows the right one. And he's going to tell you that. He knows oh. a lot about wrestling. He's a fantastic wrestler. Great psychology. He knows everything. But just personally, he was, I don't know, lacking some social skills. Well, uh, we'll call him socially awkward just to be, just to be nice. Sure. Let's go with that. <laughs> What's your biggest accomplishments in wrestling? Whew. I mean, getting to travel to Winnipeg was a really fun experience. Um, I got to wrestle with Nick, who um, wrestles under Nick Andrew. But he wrestles mainly at Stone Rockwell now, I believe, in uh, in Ontario. He has kind of like an Indiana Jones gimmick, which is really cool. He wasn't doing that on the tour, but uh, he was really nice. Just spending time with Kendello, hearing stories about some of the old wrestlers and all that was really cool. I won uh, like the, the Red Rock Wrestling Championship, which is Cowboy Mike Hughes' promotion in PEI. And I won the New Breed Wrestling Championship, which is my promotion here in, uh, in Truro, which is fun. 
Um, that was in my old persona as the answer, which I still do sometimes. But yeah, those were great experiences. Uh, Winnipeg was probably the farthest I got to travel and I got to kind of just go on the road and see that. I mean, obviously the wrestling community around here is a lot of the same guys. So whenever, no matter what promotion you're working for, where you go. You know people. Yeah, it's the same feel. It's the same sort of environment. You know what it's going to be like. But then when you go far, you kind of wonder, like, is this different? Is is, (laughs) if I get there, it's going to be all weird? Are they going to, you know, do do things differently? Um, What if they think I'm a dick just because I'm from the east? (laughs) Actually, someone told me there's sort of like a legend amongst like wrestlers in uh, Ontario and stuff about the eastern wrestlers. Like, oh, what's that? And he's like, well, just that you know, you guys are all really respectful of veterans and sort of a, a hierarchy of respect given to people that have come before you. And I was like, yeah, is it not like that everywhere? <laughs> like, that was the most surprising to me. It's like the guy that's been in for 20 years in the locker room and be like, nah, fuck you. I'm going to go do 90 super kicks and, you know, do six backflips. And that's my match. Apparently that's not an uncommon occurrence. I don't want to speak ill of all because I've met a lot of cool wrestlers in that area. But basically that's what the guy was telling me just in his experience. That I remember thinking it was kind of odd. Yeah, there was a large portion of my 20s where I kind of roamed the great Canadian West. Mm-hmm. When people found out I was from the East, I was like a mythical creature and they'd have questions to ask me. The things I always hated hearing was, hey, you're from Nova Scotia. You must love lobster. I'm like, no, I don't. But how can you not love it? You're from Nova Scotia. And I'm like, oh, I just don't love it. But I remember I was in a bar with some friends of mine one time. Mm -hmm. And my buddy was up grabbing drinks. And there's a few of us sitting at the table. Now, this is just half the story is going to be what he told me. So how true or untrue or embellished it is. Like, I think it's pretty fair. But he kind of gets in this little spat with this guy up at the bar. And the guy says, I was like, yeah, well, do you want to go? And he's got some friends with him. So my buddy makes a comment. It's like, okay, yeah, you're pretty tough when you get all your friends standing here. He's like, I got friends over there too, is what he kind of does. So this is, they're planning a brawl and nobody knows yeah. a fucking thing, right? Mm-hmm. So the guy says to him, yeah, you see my buddy here? He's from uh, down east. I think he said it was either Nova Scotia or New Brunswick. He said he was from. I was drunk at the time. So my memory is suspect at best sometimes. Sure. He says, you ever hear about those guys from down east? They don't look like, you know, big, strong, scary guys, but they go into a bar and they fucking knock out everybody. That's my buddy over here. Hmm. So then he hollers to me. He says, Robbie, get over here. So I go over. I assume he just wants me to grab the drinks. He says, Rob, where are you from? I said, uh, Nova Scotia. Why? He turns to him. Yeah, fuck you, bud. I got one of those too. <laughs> and they're just kind of shit talking. I turn to the other guy. I'm like, what's going on? The other guy that was from the East Coast. And we ended up getting along great. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what the fuck's going on with these guys. It's just... So that kind of took the wind out of the sails of that. Awesome. But yeah, just the things you hear about people from here, we're either all newfies or we've got some kind of crazy Eastern strength about us, I think. <laughs> well, that's, I guess, of all the stereotypes that could be tossed around, that's not necessarily a bad one. So no. uh, sure, let's, let's, let's go with that. Uh, no, yeah, no, Winnipeg was, was good. Uh, the funny story from that one was there's this uh, little community called Norway House, which is um, really far north. And it's like a little native community. So we went, the, the place we wrestled was like in an arena. And right beside it was like the town's only hotel slash bar slash restaurant. Like, <laughs> Laundromat. Like, yeah, uh... <laughs> so we, yeah. we stayed there. We went out to the, the bar, which is literally like the band, the, the wrestlers, and like two or three random people. Uh, the funniest part of that, oh, so I, I go off on side stories sometimes, but one of the wrestlers was talking to this woman. And like she was a very large, very older than us sort of woman that was like there. And oh dear! She was trying to convince. Yeah, she was trying to convince this particular wrestler, who I won't name, to go home with her. And he was. <laughs> then that was kind of the running story from that during that evening. She was a uh, teeth missing out of the mouth, <laughs> cackling, cackling uh, like the whole night. But anyway, so the next morning we get up. There's one ferry. There's a small little boat that kind of goes across this waterway, which is the only way to get into the community and out. So they have a ferry that cars can drive on. But we go to leave the next morning to get to our next wrestling show. And the ferry's broken. It's not running at all. Apparently, the night before, the ferry driver didn't slow down. He drove it into the bank <laughs> and broke it or whatever. So P- Peter Smith, who's kind of known in the wrestling community as being sort of a gruff, no-nonsense kind of guy, he goes to the guy, the thing, he goes, well, how long is this going to be till they fix it? And the guy's like, oh, we got to order a part. So uh, we're just waiting on that to come in. And Peter's like, well, how long that's going to take? And the guy's like, uh, two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Peter's like, two weeks? So anyway, he goes back, talks to the promoter and the other person who were kind of working on some things to figure out they eventually figure out what they're going to do and this is what we had to do was they had a small boat like a five person motorboat <laughs> that was ferrying people back and forth across that had to like get picked up or to get to go on their ways so what we did is we had to take the ring out of the out of the truck and take it over in pieces uh <laughs> probably about 15 to 20 runs back and forth taking every piece you know as much as we could per boat trip over back and forth then the community we're going to next was called um 
uh, I can't remember. It's like cold water or cold lake or something like it's not cold lake, but something like that, like a stream or a brook or something. It was another community. They sent a school bus from that community to come pick us up. So we had to cram the entire ring into a school bus and all the wrestlers and we're all crammed in there and everybody was pissed and tired. And some people just thought the show was going to be canceled because we weren't going to make it. So they just started drinking all day. And we're pretty <laughs> hammered at that point. We're on our way to the show and it's getting late. And I remember sitting there with my head against the glass in the school bus looking out the window, exhausted because I've just loaded the ring and unloaded it a bunch of times. And then we're going to a place where we're going to have to do it again. And my phone beeps and it was like, a message from my mom and it's like hey Andre me and your dad just wanted to know that we're like so proud that you're in Winnipeg living a wrestling dream <laughs> and I remember looking at the text and looking around the, the, the bus and then just exactly laughing exactly how I dreamed it. this is exactly yeah. what I dreamed of this is the dream I right down it. to the five person boat like that was a <laughs> yeah, detail exactly. I didn't think I'd ever actually get to live out but I'm so glad I did yeah it was it was surreal it was like something out of a movie like it couldn't she couldn't have timed it better it was really funny so you go underneath the moniker old school now but you said you used to wrestle as the answer and you sometimes still do yes the answer is my more nefarious persona more nefarious persona yes. when i started it was the answer and i did that for pretty much my entire career until recently i run the promotion new breed now in Toronto, mm-hmm. and uh, i do a lot of community work through new breeds so like donating blood and uh, we give all our profits from our 50 50s to the spca so it's kind of tough to be the hard-nosed heel that's handing out checks and donating blood and doing public appearances and stuff so it seemed like it was time for a change and it's gone well it's been really fun yeah, yeah shift. that's yeah. something that a lot of people I don't think consider is that when you're doing all that work, you run a family friendly promotion. So a lot of kids would get to see you, get to know you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's nice if you go out and you're donating this stuff, but a lot of the kids are going to be like, oh, that fucking prick. <laughs> <laughs> Kids used to come up and like mouth off to me at the store and stuff. Now they come up and they like want to high five or actually when I was just looking at this, which the people in the thing can't see, but this is something a, a fan gave me. They did a little drawing of me, you know, like that sort of fun stuff that you get from the. The, the resemblance is uncanny. Maybe yeah. we'll get a screenshot of that and I'll put that up sure. on the Instagram for the episode. Even the spiral eyes, I look like I'm going I'm yeah. to hypnotize somebody. Well, you do look like a demented bastard, I'm just saying. Uh, well, yes. I mean, in the answer persona, I certainly do. If you ask uh, Jen, his wife, if he's got the hypnotic eyes, she- she'll definitely tell you, yes, you will marry me. You <laughs> <Yes>. will. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> Anytime he puts on sunglasses or blinks, the spell breaks for just a second, and he's got to right. get her back on. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's been exhausting. <laughs> 12 years of making her stare into my eyes. <laughs> away don't look away oh crap uh don't let the banter fool you you can get lost in those eyes holy oh. shit on top of other things you said you're an actor i am uh started doing it mainly through theater here in Truro, um and then i started applying for a few things i got an agent in halifax and did some work in some movies and stuff started doing background and then got a few speaking roles um i was on haven on an episode i got to meet edge actually through that a professional wrestler which is really cool then I had a part, a fairly significant part in a Stephen King movie called Big Driver they filmed here with Maria Bello and um, Olympia Dukakis. Maria Bello is the owner of the Coyote Ugly Bar in the movie Coyote Ugly for all you girls who listen. Ah, I didn't realize that. Um, I recognized her, like I knew her from A History of Violence, the Cronenberg movie, and a few other things. She was on Seinfeld in an episode, and she was on Grown Ups, which I hate those movies, but she's in them. They're the worst. Oh, they're the worst. But I watched, I think, the first one and the second one with a friend one time, and I remember, like, I'm like never watching them recently. What the fuck are they about? Nothing. Like, it's literally just a bunch of Adam Sandler's friends getting together with a camera and making it up as they go along. And it certainly seems that way when you watch it. But anyway, she was really cool, really, really good actress. I got to do a scene with her in Olympia Dukakis, and Dukakis is an older actor. She won uh, an Oscar, so it was really cool to do a scene with an Oscar winner. Nice. And Stephen King, so I got to kind of, I get to get shot in the head. I had a prosthetic made in my head. I had squibs. I had blood coming out. A neck thing that had a bladder that had blood shooting out. A good friend of mine's a special effects artist, and he worked on the movie, so I got to work with him, which is really cool. God damn it, that's a spoiler. I, w- I would have been rooting for you. <laughs> well, yeah, you can track it down. It was a lifetime, it was a lifetime movie, um, but it was certainly darker than most of those sort of movies. And it was actually pretty good, I thought. I, I liked it. Um, but I've, yeah, and I've had some auditions. The, the film ministry has kind of changed in Nova Scotia since the government changed the tax credit here. So it dried up for quite a while, but it seems to kind of be coming back a little bit. I think they made a few changes to sort of make up for their mistake, in my opinion. And it seems like some of it's coming back, although most of the productions have uh, stalled because of the you know, COVID. You had a pretty big audition you were telling me about just recently. Um, yeah, The Lighthouse, the uh, the Robert Eggers movie they filmed here in Yarmouth with uh, Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. Yeah, no, I got, uh, there's, if you've seen the movie, you know that it's really only the two characters, but there is one scene, a sort of a flashback where uh, Robert Pattinson's character is sort of wrestling with uh, someone from his past. I was auditioning for that character. 
And I was talking to a couple other people that are sort of in the area that also audition a lot for sort of movies. And one of my friends who does it says, when I saw your name on the list, I knew you're probably going to get it. He said, because you look exactly the part and it would be perfect for you. And I was all pumped. Like I learned all my, there weren't really any lines. It was just sort of, um, you know, that what you had to do. So I, I studied it. I was super excited. I mean, to work with Willem Dafoe would be a dream come true. I mean, the Green Goblin, come on. <laughs> uh, but I'm also just a huge fan of his work. He's a great character actor, like one of the, one of the best. And Pattinson, I really like too. Like he's a great actor. I mean, Twilight stuff aside, which I'm sure he's acted fine in them. I never really I'm pretty sure he said he doesn't even care for Twilight that much. Well, so. Of course not. I mean, you're a young actor who wants to make money, and they're handing you tens of millions of dollars you're going to make for doing these movies. Of course you're going to do them. Like I don't blame any actor for doing something that's – especially someone early on in their career. But now, because of that, he gets to do all these cool movies like uh, Good Times. You haven't seen that? The guy that did um, – Oh, crap. What's the Adam Sandler movie that he just, the big one that was on Netflix? Oh, uh, Uncut Gems, was yeah, it? Or? Yeah. yeah. So, or the directors, the Safety Brothers, uh, or Safety Brothers, um, their previous movie. Fantastic. High Life that just came out, the uh, Claire Denis movie. So good. He He's a really good actor. And that's sort of a front. So when you do these like really big budget movies that give you tons of money, then you have the freedom to go do the good movies that you know you want to do. But anyway, hey, he's yeah, the new so Batman. Work, yeah, exactly. So to work with them would have been really cool. But anyway, like the day before I was supposed to go audition, I got an email from my agent saying they changed the role to a stunt role. And uh, I'm not a, I don't have a stunt designation. I've tried, but uh, I can't get in with the, the stunt guy to get in. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Considering the history of wrestling and everything, I've sent him everything he asked for, but then he just never got back in touch. Uh, but yeah, so it never happened, but it, was, it would have been so cool to be in that movie. I've seen I the re- movie. You I look re- more of the part than the guy that got the part. I'm just saying that. Yeah, the guy that got the part kind of looks like like a male stripper. He looks soft. He looks soft. Yeah, he's got like a little like a little pencil thin blonde mustache. He looks like he's supposed to be this gruff guy, but he's kitten shit soft. And I mean, we got you here who literally you throw yourself all over the fucking place. You get manhandled. You manhandled. You do everything you need to do, and you do well, it, yeah. definitely do it better than pencil mustache there. So. <laughs> Well, I apologize to Pencil Mustache if he's listening. I'm sure he, he was happy to get the role as well. No, fuck that guy. <laughs> he might be local. I didn't recognize him, but he must be. Thank your mom for uh, using her eyeliner to highlight your mustache a little bit. <laughs> anyway, if you haven't seen The Lighthouse, it's a crazy movie, but uh, I, I would suggest it. If you like the normal Michael Bay sort of stuff, and that's it, then don't bother. But if you actually like like deeper movies with a lot of interesting messages, then... Uh, Check it out. It's really cool. One thing uh, you do, tell us about your art. Uh, lately, like I, I did some independent comics that I've written and just sort of self-published a while ago. I haven't done anything lately. I'm getting really mad at myself for not creating something, you know, in a comic way because I've just been busy and putting it off. So I think I'm going to try to allot some of this extra time I have with everything going on to uh, to do that. So um, I have made some some graphic novels. I did one called Humbug, which is sort of a steampunk uh, version of Ebenezer Scrooge. It was sort of a kind of an adventure thing. Uh, but then shortly after I did it, like a year later, another, like a, a real version of that kind of came out, which is almost the exact same idea. Hmm. Uh, so much so that it, I don't know if maybe someone got their hands on it or if it just, I mean, coincidentally, someone came up with a similar concept, uh, and put it out. So it sort of turned me off to wanting to do more of it. Then I did like, um, uh, indie kind of thing called ha- horseshoes and hand grenades, which is just sort of like slice of life stories. And the first one was about my cat that I had growing up. So just like that sort of stuff. But I do have an idea. I think I want to do like a, a done on one sort of graphic novel, like a full story in one thing and, uh, and work on it and get it put out there. So I also do art prints, which I sell at like conventions like HowCon and those sort of things. Uh, East Coast Comic Expo and other ones in the area. Yeah, I've seen like I've seen your art. I've seen you post it up. You've got uh, you got it on Facebook and whatnot. Like I encourage people to check that out. Sure. Yeah. I've got a question for you. You've listened to this podcast now. I have, yes. I, I was I was disappointed that on the third episode, I was hoping that it would just be all your guests would be Andres. Since you had Andre Pettipa, like your second guest, I can't remember the name, but... Uh, I'm, I'm just going to do every other guest and Andre just to kind of oh, split it up a little bit. Perfect, yeah. yeah. It's Andre easier for cataloging purposes for people That's to right. find. Just go yeah. through every Nova Scotia and Andre and get your hands on. This guy, I found him uh, hitchhiking. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Andre the hitchhiker, he's like, dude, can you just let me go home to my family, please? <laughs> I keep telling you my name's Steve. Shut up, Andre. <laughs> The segment I'm looking most forward to with you, uh-huh. Celebrity Smack Talk. Oh, I yes, feel- I did. I did hear that when you, so yeah, I, I like that. I thought that was really fun. I also I like f- that you're like the the Maritimes and Mark Marin. The Maritime Mark Marin. Yeah. Do you listen to WTF? I do. Yeah. That's just. I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan. I don't miss an episode, so. That's that's huge. That's a huge compliment. Thank you. Yeah, take it. So with your uh, with your affinity for pro wrestling and your skill set, I feel like Celebrity Smack Talk is going to be awesome right now. <laughs> Sure, play it on me. So, what celebrity would you like to talk smack to? Oh, I gotta pick one. Yeah, you gotta pick. 
I mean, there's an obvious one, but I feel like that's just easy pickings. And I don't really want to get political. So, <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder who that's going to be. Exactly. Camille Nanjiani just like tweeted like, he's so fucking stupid. And then he just said, he's so tremendously idiotically stupid. And the fact that I don't even have to say the name of this person, but you immediately know who I'm talking about. It just goes to prove my point. <laughs> and like, and when you read it, you know exactly what he's talking about. And that's what I thought was really clever. Uh, let's go with Kanye West. I'm excited. Okay. Do I just say whatever I want about him? The way it goes is normally you take about 10, 15, maybe 20 seconds to okay. get your best digs out at it. If you're on a roll, we might let it go 25 oh, okay. just to treat everybody. So Kanye West, sure. listen up. Kanye, you're an incredibly talented musician, and that's fine in your own way. If you're into that sort of music, which I am and I do like, uh, that's fantastic. But please stop everything else beyond music. <laughs> everything else that you're doing is insane. And the fact that you're trying to capitalize on uh, religious, like trying to get a church going so you can get tax breaks and just hide more behind that stuff is even more insane. In a gospel album as well, it's just batshit lunatic crazy. Wearing a MAGA hat, hanging out with Joel Osteen connecting to the Kardashians for some obscene, insane reason, which is well beyond your thing. If you're talented as a musician, just be a musician. Don't try to do everything else horribly or connect your wagon to some pretty horrible people like Trump or Austin. Just do your thing and stop trying to find out. Just uh, my commentary on that. Fuck Joel Austin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fuck that guy too. Actually, if if you wanted me to talk shit about celebrities, I could talk shit about a lot of those sort of types for a very long time. I can't wait for the day they find him having sex with a hooker or a man in a in a in a closet somewhere. Because every one of these guys eventually get caught doing something like that. I just want a meteorite just to shoot out of the sky and just fucking land on him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, Joel Osteen. You are one of the biggest pieces of shit on the planet. That's my first. Hopefully, hopefully, universally caught karma will we'll catch up with some of these people. Boy, I really hate Joe Austin. I didn't realize how much I hate him. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny when you get in, like when you're involved with wrestling for so long, and then you connect, like you see, because wrestling is sort of a whole industry built on on pretending to be like working people, like you know, in the <laughs> sense, same as old grifter sort of terminology, like working marks and making them believe stuff that's not true and sort of putting on a persona and an act to get people to support you or to go to shows or buy your merchandise or whatever. And it's amazing when you are doing that for so long and then you notice the very same things uh, in other professions. I mean, obviously like all these faith healers and these uh, televangelists and, and even politicians and, and all these other things are doing the exact same thing. Right. And uh, it becomes very transparent after you get, when, when you live in a, in a, a world of, I don't want to say fakeness, but because I already had this up so early, but you live in a world of uh, people putting on masks, you, you can certainly spot other people's a lot easier. Wrestling encompasses a lot. And that's like why you see a lot of wrestlers like yourself who can naturally transition over to acting. Yeah, like The Rock, for example, is a big one. Like you have such a huge skill set. You kind of got to know a little bit about a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wrestling in itself is, uh, if you boil a little bit down to its core thing, it's eliciting, trying to elicit an emotion from your audience mm -hmm. by telling a story through, uh, you know, fighting. Um, yeah. So, you, you know, you want the, the bad guy to be disliked. You want the good guy to be liked. You want the audience to either be happy or upset with the outcome of the match based on whatever stories and where you want it to go. And yeah, and if you're in its core end, that's acting. I mean, that's anything. Yeah, and if you're in a, I guess, a wrestling situation, it's kind of live. You got to adjust on the fly. So you got to get really good at like reading a crowd, know how to work a crowd. Hey, this isn't working. If you have to call an audible and adjust. So you have to be really good at kind of reading people and directing that. And I think that's something that I'm just assuming that's helped you build like your ability just to read people one on one is because you're learning how to dictate the way things go and how to judge a situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the acting, I, I was doing the stage acting before I got into wrestling as much as I have. So it sort of was flip flop from, from that. But yeah, same thing. I mean, they're definitely transferable skills that are very useful. And yeah, you see several wrestlers go on to have successful acting careers because mm -hmm. of what they're doing. That. I mean, John Cena's doing all right with it now. Yeah. The, whenever the new. Fast and the Furious movie comes out. Yeah, we'll see how he uh, we'll see how he stacks up against Vin Diesel's acting skills. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I uh, two things about Vin Diesel. I like him. Um, I think it's a great crime that he never played Lex Luthor, in my opinion. And uh, I, I, have a, I could talk about that for a while. But the movie Pitch Black is one of the best horror movies, in my opinion, ever. That role uh, was just perfect. Pitch Black. For him. If if it stopped the Pitch Black, but like to turn him into an action hero and do the other thing is all ridiculous. But Pitch Black itself is a very very good movie. Vin Diesel's enjoyable, but he's 
like you can watch it and you're like oh, he's not great but he's just got something about him that's enjoyable and uh yeah. i would i would have liked billy zane as lex luther he would have been good too my favorite version of luther was always the um i guess we never established some huge compliment nerd as well earlier on in this but yes i am to me like the best version of lex luther has always been uh the one from the animated cartoon like the one that came out with the batman one yeah, uh, the Tom uh, Clancy, not Tom Clancy, Clancy, Clancy Brown, who also does the voice of Mr. Krabs on SpongeBob. That is correct. Yeah, no, he, because his version of Luther kind of mixed with, there's a graphic novel by my favorite comic writer, Grant Morrison, called All Star Superman, which, uh, if you haven't read it, I highly suggest it. And it's basically boiling Superman's story down to like some key elements. And it's really well done. But to me, Luther has always been what a normal human can achieve. Luther's the epitome of that. He's a man that's incredibly intelligent, super physically fit. Uh, rich, like everything that a human can achieve, like the top of human achievement is Luther. But then comes Superman, who comes out of the sky and can, you know, throw cars, fly, shoot laser beams, juggle planets, and save the day. And the whole and everybody loves him because of that when he hasn't really earned any of it. And that's mm-hmm. the core of Luther's anger. So like a sort of deep voiced, uh, like jacked, uh, rich, sort of cold Luther is the Luther that I want. And then like so then when they made the new movies and Eisenberg came in, I was like, oh come on. No, oh, he was <laughs> awful. Like let's just make the Joker Luther, which is essentially what they did. I think Lex Luther is a very good reflection of a lot of rich people today. Like it's just yeah. he has everything that he could possibly need. Like he doesn't have to worry about stopping at Dairy Queen on the way home and his card being declined when he's trying to buy himself an ice cream <laughs> sandwich. I'm sorry, I'm craving an ice cream sandwich. But I mean, he's got everything that he possibly needs and it's not enough. Exactly. Yeah. And being the epitome of human achievement, like part of being human is being jealous and uh, letting negative feelings impact you negatively. Like in Ulster Suitman, Suitman is dying and he knows he is. And he visits Luther and says, look, You've always said that you would solve all of humanity's problems, save the world, do everything. If I wasn't hearing your way, I'm not, not going to be. Here's your chance. Do it. And Luther like stares at him and then spits at him and then turns away. And it's like just this bile, this hatred. And like no matter what, he's just so jealous and so angry that no matter what, he, he'll never get over it. And that's one thing I've always really liked about the character. It's a very human emotion, which I really like. About. DC has always done villains better than Marvel, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'll agree with that. I mean, certainly a lot of the villains are, have reached more iconic standards than beyond the comic world. <laughs> like most people would probably recognize, will recognize the Joker before they recognize Dr. Doom. Yeah. Whether those two characters, are, they're not the same really, but they both have really established colorful histories and whether, you know, one is better written than the other just depends on the person writing it, I guess. That's a good point. That's true. Who's your favorite comic villain? Oh, of all time? The last five minutes. Of course, all time. Okay, sure. Um, uh, I, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan, as most people probably who know me know. Um, so I really like a lot of his villains. Um, I think Mysterio is probably one of my all-time favorite villains, so I was pretty happy to see him appear in a recent movie, and I really like Jake Gyllenhaal's version of it. Definitely uh-huh. a different take on it, but it was very well done. As far as like the, the big, colossal villains, Thanos has always been my favorite. And I've also, as a comic fan, it's been a real honor to, or pleasure rather, to see that character get sort of a real good arc and appearance in the, the Marvel movies, because he's always been one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Plus, he's created by Jim Starlin, who's one of my favorite uh, Marvel writers. Oh, you're a fanboy. <laughs> I, I really, really am. Believe me, I could talk about comics all day. Thanos is your favorite. And obviously, Spider Man's your favorite hero. He certainly is, yeah. Okay, question. Of the three, Maguire, Holland, and Garfield, who's your favorite Spider Man? Holland. Holland? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, I, like, I like the others. Like, Tobey Maguire was a good Peter Parker. Um, I'm not saying he's not a good Spider-Man, but it's just that his Spider-Man didn't, didn't tell a ton of jokes and he wasn't particularly funny. But, like, his angsty Peter Parker stuff was fine. Like, I like those movies a lot. Spider-Man 2 with Doc Ock is probably one of the best Spider-Man movies. It might be the best one they've made yet. Garfield, I didn't mind. He was a, the costume looked really good and he looked good in the role. But, I don't know. I feel like if he was under the direction of a better writer, I might have liked him more. It's just the second movie was just a dumpster fire. But the uh, Holland kind of marries it all. Like he's a really good Spider Man. He's a really good Peter Parker. To me, he encaptures the the beginnings of the character, the high school student, all that sort of stuff, the best. And I really, I really enjoy it. I think he's really good. So I just asked you two pretty decent questions about uh, your favorite comic book characters. So I guess the next question is: Are you ready for five stupid questions? (laughs) Bring it on. You know the segment. I do. I'm familiar. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in life. They tell you there are no stupid questions. <laughs> Old school Andre Myatt will have to provide the answer for five of them. <laughs> like, what's it on South Park when they say there's no such thing as stupid questions? Just stupid people. Hey, I'm asking these. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm answering them. We're both in the same boat. 
What's your rapper name? Oh, actually, I, I kind of know this. So I read recently that Childish Gambino, Donald Glover, got his name from using it in a Wu-Tang rap name generator. He just put his name in and it gave him Childish Gambino. So mine was, uh, I, I did the same thing and it was Respected Genius was what came out. Holy shit. Yeah, I know. So I thought, well, if I'm going to have a rapper name, I think res- it seems a bit lofty to me, pretty pretentious to call yourself Respected Genius, but hey, why not? So Respected Genius, because <laughs> the, for the same reason Donald Glover is Childish Gambino. All right. If you were to invent a new window, what would you call it? Like a, like a, a house window? Don't give a fuck. It's your window. Okay, sure. All right. I don't know what I'll call it. Uh, so one of my favorite words in the English language is defenestration. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why. If you're not familiar with the word, it literally means going through a window. So whenever you see someone get thrown through a window in a movie, they've been defenestrated. Yeah, uh, we'll call it Fennis Windows. That's, you've got some really well thought out answers here for these. Well, you know, I, I have a lot of time in my hands, Robert. What shape is the most obnoxious? Rhombus. A rhombus. <laughs> I feel like you've actually thought about a lot of these before. I, I actually didn't think about that one, but for some reason, rhombus came to head. It seems obnoxious. It <laughs> seems like something an obnoxious person would say. If you're like, hey, look at that weird shape over there, they'd be like, actually, that's a rhombus. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, okay, and then go about your day. All right, you're familiar with Bob Dylan, right? Yes. Okay, good, good. I know you are. That's just to make sure that this here has context. Is walking up a road detrimental to being a man? No, I don't think so. (laughs) It depends how many roads you walk up, though, apparently. For anyone who doesn't get the reference to the song, is how many roads must a man walk down before you can call him a man? So if you walk up, yeah. Yeah, if you walk up, yeah, I'd say no. I, (laughs) I, I think it's, I think the... The direction is in the eye of the beholder. What Simpsons character would you like to fight the most? Duff Man. Duff Man? <laughs> yeah. What of a fucking monster are you? <laughs> he's awesome. Come on. He's, he's like a living wrestling character. He's hilarious. You just want the challenge. I do. He's also, he's Jax. So he'd probably kick my ass. But, you know, he's an actor, so he might be a wuss too. Hey, don't sell yourself short. Some guy just asked you to become a wrestler for standing in the crowd. You're not a small man yourself. That's true. I'm certainly not Duff Man. I mean, come on. Yeah, but you got to remember... This is the Simpsons, so when they draw you in there, you're going to ball up your hand and you're going to be fucking packing thunder in that fist, bud. Perfect. All right. I'm coming for you, deaf man. All right. So that's our five stupid questions. Do you feel like I've hurt your IQ a little bit? Yeah, that was a good run. I like that. Okay, here, I'll give you a bonus question. Which wrestler's facial hair do you like the least? Um, When Snitsky, when he had that weird little, I don't think he he has a full beard now. But when he was doing that whole it's not my fault thing with like causing Lita's miscarriage with Kane, he had that <laughs> weird little like thing that came down and then it just poofed out. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty bad. And Keep also anyone, anyone who doesn't watch wrestling and just heard when he caused Lita's miscarriage is going to be like, what the <laughs> fuck are they watching? Yeah, it's wrestling. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not like a, a standout for some of the weirder storylines and things that have happened in professional wrestling. I think that's a Vince Russo special. He was a writer for the Attitude Era of wrestling and i think there was two miscarriages during that period of time wasn't there was he behind the mark henry thing with uh, uh <laughs> May young and all that was that, was that a part of that i want to say yes i'm hoping yes basically what happened here is mark henry former olympic weightlifter world's strongest man signed a contract with the wwf he was put in a storyline where he was called sexual chocolate oh baby Sexual chocolate was insatiable in bed until he hooked up with, what was she, like 85-year-old Mae Young? Yeah, probably around there. Mae Young then uh, had to tell sexual chocolate, world's strongest man, Mark Henry, that she was pregnant with his child. Yes. And that didn't go on for the full term because she prematurely gave birth to, do you want to tell them? Do you want to tell them? (laughs) A human hand. A human uh, hand. He did hand. not mishear him. Yeah, this is wrestling. This is, uh, well, the, I mean, the, the era of wrestling now is certainly taken in a more serious bend for the most part. But uh, yeah, back then that was not unexpected and totally strange. Very weird. I'm enjoying, have you been watching the Dark Side of the Ring TV show? I have been watching that. It's very good. Um, I, re- I enjoy watching uh, Vince Russo talk and then watching uh, Jim Cornette just like angrily <laughs> yell about how much he hates Vince Russo for 10 minutes. If you're a big fan of pro wrestling, you have to watch Dark Side of the Ring. Even if you're not, like I have yeah. friends that don't know anything about wrestling, but it's a very interesting show regardless. We're just I was, talking yeah. about the real life stories behind. I was going to say, if you like true c- crime podcasts, yeah. for example, if you're into true crime, yeah. watch Dark Side of the Ring. Like it's got something for everybody i mean there's an episode with macho man and miss elizabeth so there's a love story for all you sappy people 
<laughs> it doesn't end very well, but yeah. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole lot of fucking murdering going on. I will say that. Oh, there is yeah. a ridiculous <laughs> amount of murdering going on in the world of wrestling. Well, most of them are about someone getting killed. Like the Bruiser Brody one was really sad. The Dino Bravo one they just did was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, that's... The Chris yeah. Benoit one was heartbreaking. Um, oh, man, that's... Yeah. yeah. You know, if you're a human being, you'll yeah. enjoy the show. If you have empathy at all towards other human beings, you mm-hmm. can probably learn a thing or two and feel a little sad. You gotta stay safe, buddy. I don't want to see you on that show. I don't think I've I've achieved the level of fame that's gonna have me getting involved with mobsters or going on murder binges. You uh you don't know how to cook meth, so you're not important to anybody in the drug trade. <laughs> not yet. I watched a few more episodes of Breaking Bad. Tony, don't do it. <laughs> well, I'll stick to better call Saul then. So we've covered acting, we've covered comic books, we've covered wrestling. Tell us about advanced multimedia and design. Oh, that's just my um, my business. I have a as a graphic designer, I have a business. Basically, what I do is websites and general design work, like logos and flyers and that sort of stuff for businesses. I also do social media management, which I look after the social media for a few businesses, host and uh, on their behalf, work out sales with them and uh, targeting audiences and doing that sort of thing. So it's been a good run. I've been doing it self employed for six years, I think six seven years. So it's been going well, and uh, yeah, it's been allowed me to keep working during this this uh pandemic does most of us home i have a lot of extra time because all those other things aren't going on right now so but it's good it gives me time to catch up on stuff so yeah that's uh, website, let me know if this thing gets any bigger or if i'm actually of any level of noteworthiness i will definitely give you a call because i'm barely able to cobble together this podcast by every oh, release they sound, day they, they sound good they really do i've got like i've got two weeks to do these basically like I do every second Sunday for now and I'm still just barely able to get it up on time. So, well, I assume you have a life outside of this podcast. No, no. <laughs> no. no, I just cover myself in Cheetos and drink until, until the wee hours. How can you see that? The camera is only like shoulder height on me. God uh, damn it. I, I see some orange in there. There's a reflection in the window. That's right. The oh. Cheeto reflection. So is there anything that you would like to plug? Uh, sure. New breed wrestling is the promotion I run here in Truro. Um, we haven't been doing any shows because everything going on. We, we've canceled all our shows up until the fall, which it looks like we'll have to cancel those too, but I'm not, we're not hundred percent sure yet. Um, but when things get back to normal and we get wrestling again, it'd be great to see anybody and everybody who wants to come out. It's in Truro, right in the heart of Truro with the Truro Legion. Uh, we have an entire, our entire roster is all local guys that are established and, uh, really good. We get some great crowds. It's a really fun time. So you get a chance, come on out. And if you, if you like wrestling or you want to see something different, go to any wrestling show, not even mine, just get out there, experience live wrestling. And I think you'll be surprised with how much you enjoy it. But if you've only got money to go to one wrestling show, make sure you go to his. Sure. Oh, question for you. Do you need a manager sometime? I'm bored. <laughs> sure. Sure. You should come out to a show sometime. Absolutely. I would absolutely love to come out to a show when, uh, Everything's all cleared up. I could. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, uh, well, one of your contemporaries, uh, a good friend of mine, is a stand up comedian as well. His name's Mark Walker, and he lives here in Truro, and he's our ring announcer. So we, uh, we're, we're not, we're certainly not against having uh, comedians be involved. So absolutely. All right. I'm like full on decked out to the nines, going to accompany you to ringside, make sure there's no shenanigans, make sure you get a fair <laughs> shake. I, th- I think you'd be a better heel manager personally. But, really? Yeah. I think you, I think you got it in you. I think you do. A heel manager? What are you talking about? I'm a nice fucking guy, okay? I'm good with fucking people. Why can't you fucking understand that? <laughs> right to the guy from Office Space. Yeah, yeah that's people, the reference there. <laughs> people understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Underrated movie. Oh, amazing movie. So this has been episode three, What on Rob Green's Earth. Do you like the title? Uh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, this is a moment of humility for me to admit this. I didn't get it at first. When you, <laughs> when you in, in, the fir- in the first podcast, when you're talking, you said like, this is the title and I'm really clever. I think it's really smart. I'm like, what's so smart about it? And then after like 10 minutes, I was like, oh, what in God's green earth? It's, yeah, it makes perfect sense. So <laughs> I got it. It just took me a little bit. So I'm, I'll admit to you and to the people that uh, I'm, sometimes I can be a bit sl- up on the slow take. I wonder if that's the problem and why I don't have a million listens yet. <laughs> That could be it. This could be it. Just everybody's stupid. That could be the problem. Yeah, that's definitely it. If you don't listen to this, you're stupid. I don't know how that message is going to get across to you if you don't listen to this. They should just change your tagline. If you don't listen to this, you're stupid. See, and that's why you run a brilliant goddamn multimedia company. That's, that's right. why you're good at handling businesses. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. If you've ever seen a business where it says you're fucking stupid, if you don't listen to this, you know who's handled that. Yeah, that's me. That's the, the million dollar account I'm going to land. He's earned every goddamn penny of this <laughs> all right so i got one more request yes in your best wrestling promo i want you to cue the exit music on this oh okay 
This is Old School Andre Mayad, and you have been listening to What on Rob Green's Earth. Hit it! (laughs) 